Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 11th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss where the budget stands as it passes the House and starts being worked on by Senate Finance. Second, we explore an interesting interaction that occurred during the budget debate on the House floor related to a long-term fiscal plan. Third, we discuss how we think the Alaska constitutional defenders are leading with their chin in these early stages of the debate. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into the weekly top three. I think the you know it's interesting time. Uh, I was just commenting on the fact that you know we haven't hit the ninety day session, but twice in almost fifteen years, and yet here we are, you know, doing our doing our thing here. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the budget. We just got the uh, we just got the one half of the budget done um, from the House this weekend. Seven point seven billion dollars, um, which, uh, well, I, I don't even know where to begin. I'll let you take the wheel there. Well, that's a little misleading number um, because James, when he does that number, James Brooks uh, at the ADN, soon to be with uh, State News or something, he's moving He's moving his uh, his platform to, a, or he's moving his uh, uh, byline to another platform. Uh, when James does that, he throws in the kitchen sink. He throws in what essentially is FY24, but uh, the FY24 budgeting uh, with the forward funding of uh, K through 12. And he throws in the permanent fund uh, dividend uh, as well uh, as, uh, as, as the legislature sometimes does with the UGF uh, money. Once you, once you take those two out, uh, it's still a healthy number, but it's not, it doesn't have a seven in front of it. Uh, once you take those out, the budget as it came out of house finance was 5.06 billion. Um, and as it's leaving the house floor and heading toward the Senate, uh, it's down to about 4.95 billion. Now I've got in that a placeholder of about 160 million, uh, the governor's original proposal uh, for the capital budget. So if you take the capital budget out, it's about uh, 4.83 billion or so. So once you, once you, once you Reduce, once you take out the FY24 funding, which is the K through 12 forward funding, and you take out the PFD, uh, you get a you get a number that's much more in line with uh, much more in line with 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 where we have been in recent years. I, I, there's a couple of things. One, the the number that came out of the House was smaller than the number that came out of House Finance House Finance by about 100 million dollars. That was primarily because they 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 voted out or or took out uh, some forward funding that they had put in uh, at Sarah Rasmussen's request in House Finance for oil and gas tax credits. They took out the forward funding of the oil and gas tax credits, so that reduced it by about 120 million, and then plus or minus uh, other changes they made. That it's, it's down about 100 million from from coming out of House Finance. The other thing that James doesn't talk about, but that but that we need to keep our eye on is what's going on in the supplemental budget, the FY22 supplemental budget, and they've still got uh, about 270 million or so uh, plugged over there coming out of the house. So it's um, it, it's it's a healthy number, but it's not it's not the seven billion that, that people think about. 
over in the um, or the James uh, the ADN headlines would would lead you to over in the Senate. The Senate has come up with their capital budget, uh, the initial capital budget they talked about yesterday, and I was surprised, um, somewhat pleasantly surprised. Uh, the Senate uh, finance initial capital budget is less uh, than what the governor asked for. Um, and it's uh, uh, down to about uh, $190 million UGF. It's bigger once you throw in DGF and certainly bigger once you throw in the federal funds. But from a UGF standpoint, it's down to about $190 uh, million. The governor had asked for uh, uh, something over uh, $200 million. So it's... Um, uh, from a spending standpoint, uh, the the legislature is high. Uh, it's higher than it was last year before you take into account the supplemental. Uh, but it's not it's not they they're not blown through the they're, they're not blowing out the the ceiling in terms of in terms of spending. The problem to me, the problem is on the revenue side. Uh, about a billion of the uh, of the five billion plus or minus that uh, that's coming out of the house uh, is from PFD cuts. So about twenty percent of the budget is being financed from by Alaska families, and it's being financed with the most regressive approach um, you possibly can have. The Senate hasn't acted. I, I see you've got the chart up on the on the far right. That's the Senate. Finance Committee uh, 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 process so far, they haven't acted on the PFD. So right now, they have no PFD uh, in the in the Senate bill. But on the House side, uh, about a billion dollars of that five billion dollar spend um, is coming uh, on the backs of Alaska families, and it's coming through PFD cuts, uh, the most regressive approach they can they can have. So the the, the problem the problem with the budget is spending. Uh, but it's not as bad as 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 I think some uh, some uh, portray it to be. Uh, the problem is is what they're doing on the revenue side and the fact that they continue to finance a huge amount of the budget, twenty percent of the budget um, uh, through PFD cuts. And I think that's that's where the that's where the attention really my attention is is as we go through this process. And I think that's where the attention of uh, of Alaska families ought to be as well. You know, and I know that you say we're not, <clears throat> you're not including the forward funding and some other things, you know, and that, that this, the number that James Brooks quotes of $7.7 billion, but essentially they are encumbering that money, right? I mean, they're encumbering the money. That's money that could go towards paying a full PFD, or it could go to a constitutional budget reserve, or it could go, I mean, there's a lot of things that could be done with it. So even though it's not technically part of that $5.05 billion dollar, it is still encumbered and it's moving forward and the money essentially is being spoken for. So shouldn't we be including it or what, what say you? Well, it's FY 24 money. I mean, sure. So what they're really doing is they're designating, they're designating savings uh, for FY 24. They could use it when we get to FY 24, uh, they could use it for a different purpose. I mean, the fact that the fact that this legislature has appropriated it for K through 12 uh, in FY24, the next legislature could could reappropriate it for uh, for another purpose. It's just it's a it's a way of stuffing savings, of stuffing money into savings. Now it's not a very it's not a very useful way because it doesn't earn a whole lot of. It's not in the permanent fund, so it's not it's not earning the returns that the permanent fund does. It's not even in the CBR, so it's not earning the returns that the uh, that the CBR does. Uh, it's just sort of going to set off there to the side. It'll earn. They'll have it in uh, in money accounts. Tre Treasury will put it in money accounts and it'll earn a little bit. But it's not, I don't, y yes, they are encumbering it. Yes, they could use it for other things this year. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's not adding to spending this year. It is part of the, much more part of the FY24 budget uh, than it is the, uh, the FY23 budget. Now, as you look at both of these budgets, of course, the House's budget, which is finished, and the Senate, which is now currently working on their budget, um, you know, give us a feeling. I mean, what do you see? Where do you see the, these things meeting in the middle? Uh, you know, what's going to have to be conferenced out? What's going to have to be put in? Wh what, what do you see between these two budgets as they look at this moment? Well, right now, uh, the House is at 4.95. Uh, the Senate is, at, again, including a placeholder for capital spending. The Senate, including their capital, their initial capital bill, 
uh, and the operating bills, the Senate has passed its oper or the Senate finance has the operating bills that the Senate subcommittees passed as well. So this is about 4.86. So it looks at looks like we're around 4.9 uh, in terms of UGF spending, FY23 um, UGF spending. And that's up. I mean, well, it, it's, it's up before you count in, uh, before you count in the, uh, the supplemental. Last year's uh, UGF budget, spending budget, was about 4. Point, let's see, 4.77, 4.75, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, 4.65, uh, uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. And um, uh, it, so we're up from last year's budget by a couple hundred million dollars, $300 million. Um, but, but last year's budget is now getting distorted by the supplemental that they're, that they're backing into the FY22 budget. It's higher than it needs to be. I mean, we, I think, I think all, everybody certainly on this uh, program and, and, and a lot of analysts agree that it's higher than it, uh, than it needs to be. But it's not, here's, you know, the concern going into this legislature with all of the money that was coming in from, from, uh, from oil prices was that we were going to have another blowout. And we may yet have a blowout. I mean, we haven't seen what the Senate's going to finally do with the capital budget or what the House is going to do with the capital budget when it, go, when it goes back over there. But I think the concern was we were going to have a blowout. And, and we're not. Uh, we're, we're, having, we're having, you know, creep in terms of, of increased spending here, there, and in and, and, and a couple of other places, uh, but we're not having a blowout. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the weekly top three. Um, the PFD, as you mentioned, not listed yet in that chart I was just showing a minute ago from you um, for the Senate side. And of course, we already kind of know where this is potentially going because we've seen the uh, we've seen the philosophy of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, any, you know, any guesses? Do they try and match what the House is doing? Do they try and come in lower? Do they, do they come in higher? I mean, what, what are your thoughts? I don't, uh, I don't think they'll come in lower. Um, there's a question about whether or not they adopt this energy relief uh, theory or, or, or classification for half of uh, what essentially is half of the PFD that they're that the House is proposing to pay out. Uh, I think the Senate debate in Senate finance is going to be interesting whether they try to come up with a bill, uh, a fiscal plan bill or a, or a PFD bill uh, that, uh, that supports whatever PFD approach they take. I mean, Senate bill, what is it, 299 that they, that they debated again, uh, incorporates the 2575 approach one, uh, yeah, and, and the interesting thing over on the Senate side is whether they're going to try to cram that through uh, to match what the House, uh, what House Ways and Means at least has has pushed up uh, to House Finance. Now, that's sort of that's sort of a, a, a useless effort because I assume if a bill passes, even if a bill passes that's uh, that's POMB twenty five seventy five, the governor will veto it. So it's so it's sort of a, a useless effort. Uh, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see if uh, this is Natasha's final session. This is Nat Natasha's final, uh, at least this go round, her final uh, uh, push at, uh, at Senate finance. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it, Bert may not be in control next legislature. So it may be Bert's last, uh, last hurrah as, uh, as chair. It's, it's, it'll be interesting to see if they try to push this bill out. Notwithstanding the fact that the governor will likely veto it, if they try to push this bill out as right. sort of their quote final solution to uh, uh, to uh, to the PFD, that that's that's going to be one interesting thing that goes on. The other uh, that I'm that I'm going to watch for uh, as the Senate goes through the the process this week and probably on the Senate floor next week is whether the capital budget in fact blows out and whether they can keep themselves restrained. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of capital budget items as uh, as they as they go through the process. One final question: uh, the uh, uh, the stipulatory uh, of nature of some of the stuff in the House, you know, the contingency language, uh, where they say we must increase the base student allocation, or if the I think it was either or or the one point two billion doesn't get forward funded, they also left a fifty seven million dollar increase. Uh, to base it on other pieces, this got again the stipulatory stuff. What are your thoughts on on that? Because this is again hints of uh, of Bert Stedman's maneuvers in the past, where 
of getting something was contingent on voting something else. Yeah, I mean, you always hate to see that uh, because you just want you just want a pure bill. You just want to give us the numbers. Don't don't try to don't try to try to game it. But there's nothing huge. I don't think there's anything huge uh, that's uh, that's tied to all that uh, right now. Uh, the BSA, I, the House Finance, uh, presumably is going to take up a bill that's been kicking around the House that would increase. Uh, the BSA permanently uh, in statute. We've talked about that on a prior show, uh, along with a bill that's kicking around that presumably will come to House Finance uh, that would uh, go back to a defined uh, defined benefit plan, uh, at least for certain state employees. So, I mean, they're they're trying to they're trying to make these uh, these permanent changes. Um, it'll be interesting to see if they make it through the House and if they make those through the Senate and what the governor does about it. But I, there's nothing. There's nothing huge in in what they've done in the in the in the budget bills right now uh, that uh, that is a concerns me a, a, a lot. What do you think, Brad, about the uh, the forward funding? You think that's something that the governor is going to uh, to veto? Do you think that he'll veto some of that? I mean, being an, a former educator and all that. Well, it's a it's an election consideration. Um, it, it really depends on what his pollsters tell him how how well how well a veto would play, or whether that stirs up the whole recall thing again. And while it wouldn't lead to a recall this close to the election, it would it would lead to a, a pushback. Um, forward funding to me is uh, it, it's not it's not the the greatest way to do things. I mean, it's an appeal to a constituency, right? What the House is doing is saying, you know, we value education and we want to show you how much we value education by sticking this money uh, into uh, into essentially designated saving, savings for uh, K through 12 uh, next year. It doesn't guarantee it. As I say, the next legislature can use that money for something else, just like they you know, divert the PFD uh, to uh, to support something else in government. They can divert the uh, they can divert that forward funding to something else in government. Uh, it's, it's more a political messaging tool. Um, and it's a way it, 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 it doesn't, it, it takes money out of the hands of the current legislature in a way, but it just sort of sticks it, uh, sticks it into savings. So it doesn't, doesn't hugely bother me. Now, you know, I, it could be used, that money could have been used to, to, to pay the PFD um, and let next year fund itself. Let FY24 fund itself and find the find money for the for K through 12 uh, next year, uh, rather than you know forward fund it this year and take the money out of the PFD to uh, to help contribute toward that. So it's bothersome in that respect. But in terms of in terms of you know using this form of designated savings as opposed to just putting it in the CBR or letting it go to the CBR or putting it in the SBR. Uh, or uh, or something else. It's just savings. I mean, it, and 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 it's sitting there for the next for the next legislature. Does the governor veto it? I don't know. I, it, as I say, it depends upon what his pollster tells him to do. And of course, it's a good thing we don't have any dedicated funds in this state. That's all I'm saying <laughs> right now. I mean, it's a good thing that the that the Constitution prohibits that kind of stuff because otherwise, you know, we could have a real mess on our hands. Uh, Donna says, "Never mind, forward funding is unconstitutional." Well. You know, the problem is, of course, is that the uh, the current court system has decided, no, the legislature can do pretty much whatever the hell they want uh, at this point, well, or, or the law decides not, what the law decides kind of thing. What the Constitution says, you can't dedicate funds, right? Right, exactly. Uh, and, and, and what they're doing is they're designating funds, which in Alaska is a difference. Um, so, yeah, it's... I, I, you know, <laughs> no, wait you a second. The, you did you just say that? that did you just say that with a straight face? Did you just say that that... I mean... The difference between dedicated and designated, and I mean, I understand what you're saying, Brad, but really, can we say that with a straight face? The Constitution prohibits dedicating funds, so instead we just designated it. Um, and I think the, it was a, f- a few weeks back that I actually pulled the definitions of both words up, and they are almost interchangeable. So, I mean, at some point, do you just, I mean, how can you? How can we say that with a straight face? Constitution does not allow dedicated funds, but we can designate the hell out of them. Well... It, it depends on what the, it depends on whether the next legislature can change it. I mean, that's that's sort of the difference. If it's a dedicated fund like the like the permanent fund, uh, the next legislature, or any subsequent legislature can't change the can't change the the funding. Uh, if it's designated funds, the next legislature can change it. So that's 
Yeah, that you won't find that you won't find that in the dictionary for sure. But that's uh that's that's the practical difference between the two. The next one is going to be the question of did we almost just have a fiscal plan? I mean question mark. And this, of course, is something that's raised a lot of angst in the last few days is this discussion of um <clears throat> of intent language. And uh, you're gonna get down into this, and I've got some of the I've got some of the quotes and the handwritten stuff and everything else. But uh, give us a little quick tease here, Brad, going into this. Well, there was a there was a point uh, during the de- House, House the floor debate uh, on the bill where um, there was a majority voting in favor of POMV fifty fifty uh, with uh, some language, some intent language around it, uh, and it had Garen Tarr and Ben Carpenter uh, voting together uh, in support uh, of a bill, and I, I find that or in support of this amendment, and I find that interesting it ultimately didn't come to anything uh but i find uh, i find that whole process interesting uh, and i think it's useful to to talk about it some so people are aware of what went on brad keith lee alaskans for sustainable budgets is our guest it's the weekly top three we finished up with number one number two from this last week was the question geez did we almost have a fiscal plan there at one point or not brad tell me what your uh what you're talking about here with that question? So during the debate uh, on the House floor of the of the House uh, fi- of, the, of the budget bill, uh, Delana Johnson proposed Amendment Number Four, and Amendment Number Four was to adopt the governor's uh, POMV fifty fifty uh, approach, split the uh, uh, POMV draw fifty percent between the PFD and fifty fifty uh, percent to government. Um, and it was, you know, it, it, it seemed when it started out to be just another one of those attempts to get the PFD uh, higher. Um, and then during the course of the debate, there was an amendment, a proposed amendment to, the, uh, to that proposal, to POMV 5050. And remember, POMV 5050 was part of the uh, uh, principles that the uh, Fiscal Policy Working Group uh, came up with. So during the during the course of the debate, there was an amendment, amendment number one to, uh, to which I have number which, four, which I have up the on this, which I have up on the screen right now for folks who are looking there. And it was proposed. Now, this is this is the interesting part. It was proposed by Garen Tarr, Ben Carpenter, Liz Snyder and Kevin McCabe, uh, two from the left, uh, two from the right. Uh, Propose this language and the language is, as you got up on the screen, is the intent of the legislature that the 50-50 proposal for the dividend be part of the full fiscal plan that includes a spending cap, 300 to 500 million in new revenue and continued work on budget reductions. And so basically what this proposal was to take the rest of the fiscal policy working group proposal, attach it as, um, uh, attach it as, as this legislative intent to the POMB 50-50 approach uh, and uh, and put that on the floor uh, as an amendment. The debate uh, on on this proposal, uh, essentially to incorporate the working group, uh, the work of the working group, the debate was interesting. I mean, you had uh, Republicans, some Republicans supporting it, conservative Republicans supporting it. You had some uh, uh, liberal progressive uh, Democrats uh, supporting it. And then you sort of teased out uh, uh, those who, uh, those who, you know, sort of suddenly were concerned about what was going on. Steve Thompson said, wait a second, we're talking about revenues. What kind of revenues are we talking about? Are we talking about taxes? David Eastman uh, got up uh, in essentially in opposition to it saying, wait a second, we're talking about revenues. What kind of revenues are we talking about? If we're talking about oil revenues from additional production, that's great. Um, Adam Wool got up and said, yeah, yeah, that came from the fiscal policy working group, but that was just only eight people. Another eight people would have come up with a different proposal. Uh, I don't like this one, said Adam, uh, and so I'm going to vote. Uh, I'm going to vote against it. Ultimately, the vote on this uh, on this amendment uh, was. Let's see if I got this here. The vote on this amendment was 22 uh, in favor and 17 against. So. It, the, 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 the body as a whole adopted this amendment, incorporating the rest of the fiscal policy working group uh, 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 into, the, uh, into amendment number four. 
uh, and that, and you can see that that vote is odd too. You've got right. all the way from Ben Carpenter to, um, to Kathy Tilton, uh, to Garen Tarr, to Stutes, to Spahn Holtz, to Chris Tuck, to Sarah, Van Sarah Vance. It's a, it's a very eclectic, uh, uh, 22, but voting for essentially voting for the, the working group's fiscal policy plan. And then you've got, you got, a, a an equally strange vote against it. You've got uh, uh, Ron Gillum um, <laughs> voting against uh, the fiscal policy working group. You got Calvin Schrage, who was on the fiscal policy working group. And remember, the fiscal policy working group came up with a unanimous recommendation. You got Schrage voting against it. Uh, you've got uh, Adam Wool voting against it. You've got uh, Delana Johnson. <laughs> voting voting against it you got andy josephson voting against it. you got chris kirkin voting against it so it's it's just a very it's an interesting split and and i'm going to go back to this and really sort of under try to understand what the motivations of all these people were but you had them adopting the uh the fiscal policy working group and i'll now, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note sorry. that this is really one of the in fact josephson mentions it about the fiscal policy. this is really the only time this has come up as any kind of substantive discussion since the Fiscal Policy Working Group put out their unanimous recommendation, remember a group of eight people plus four alternates that came up with a unanimous decision. And these people are the most politically diverse, most far left, most far right people came all together and said unanimously, this is what we think will do it. You have to do it holistically. You have to look at it all. And then they get riddled full of holes when it comes down to it. This is the only time it's been discussed. Yeah. And, and, and it got, now a lot now these people were voting i mean sort of tell sarah rasmussen as part of the majority these people were voting knowing that it was likely ultimately going to be defeated uh that the amendment as a whole even once it's got attached even with this attached the amendment as a whole was likely going to be defeated so you've got you've got some political motivations going on in these votes uh but these people voted uh in support of essentially uh signaling that they were in support of the fiscal policy working group uh, proposal and i and I think that's something. I think that's something to work with. Unfortunately, this legislature. You know, we're going to have an election. This legislature is not going to be there next year. And some of these people aren't going to be there next year. Um, uh, Jonathan Christ Tompkins, for example, who was co-chair of the Fiscal Policy Working Group, has announced he's not running again. So we're going to start over with a new group next year. But but this was this was a moment that I think was was useful in saying, you know, if we ever could get together, this looked like something that that would that would get us together. Um, so it was it was useful. Now, ultimately, uh, this is this was intent language attached to a hard amendment that would go to POMB 5050. As Ben Carpenter explained it, he said, let's get POMB 5050 done. And then this intent language really means that we're, that we're going to talk about these other things. And faced with the decision of a hard POMB 5050 with a very, very soft uh, intent language, uh, amendment number four, uh, to which this got attached, eventually went down, uh, and it went down 16 to 23, um, with, uh, with, with a lot of flipped votes going on in the 16. So for example, POMB, this amendment, POMB 5050 with the intent language attached, David Eastman voted for it. Ron Gillum voted for it. After having voted against the intent language, right. they now vote for the amendment with the intent language attached. But right. so- so, so, the, so the votes, the, the the final vote was to was to defeat it. But there there was a moment there on the floor that I think we really had, as you say, it's the only time we've really discussed the fiscal pol the the whole legis the whole house has discussed the fiscal policy working group uh, uh, production. And I take some heart in the fact that that amendment to incorporate uh, fiscal policy working group uh, was successful. All right. Well, we may have slipped by it, and uh, and maybe we'll come back to that. I guess we'll have to see what comes out of the Senate on this. Let's move on quickly to number three here. we got about four and a half minutes, uh, and we're talking about the Constitutional Convention. And the opponents of this are out in force uh, because I think they see the potential to have all their work, quote-unquote, undermined that they've been doing all these years. And so they're coming out, and you say that they are leading with their chin. Explain that to us. <laughs> Well, so here's here's the I I I, I right now I oppose the constitutional convention. I think it creates too many risks. But but here's the thing that's just really odd to me about it. 
one of the arguments for against the constitutional convention is that the constitution is um, uh, is is a document that sets up a a a a, 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 pull, a fully uh, 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 protective government, uh, a government that functions, a government that works. Uh, one of the quotes in the uh, in the Juno Empire's coverage of the Constitutional Convention, it says, "Other state co constitutions have been extremely prescriptive." Uh, uh, Gordon Harrison said, "Gordon Harrison is the author of Alaska's Constitution: A Citizen Guide." Uh, Harrison said, "In some instances, setting salaries for low-level government officials." According to Harrison, Alaska's Constitution created a strong legislative branch that met annually and could address the needs of the state through law. Well. The problem with the, the, the thing that's motivating a lot of people uh, with, the, with the Constitution is, or the Constitutional Convention is that the legislature stopped following its own laws. I mean, you were talking about the 90-day session earlier. We can talk about the PFD statute. The, the legislature, essentially with laws that govern it, have become lawless, has become lawless. Right. And a lot of people are, a lot of people are pushing for a Constitutional Convention because of that. Those defending the, the, the defenders of the Constitution, look at the lead. It's Kathy Giesel, it's John Coghill, uh, it's Bryce Edgman, people who are people who are leading the lawlessness of the Constitution. So every time they write an article with that byline and saying Kathy Giesel's co-chair, John Coghill's co-chair, Bryce Edgman's co-chair, they're reminding people how lawless the legislature is because they're the ones that engage have engaged in the lawlessness. So to me, that's just leading with your chin. Every time I read. I read one of those read one of those commentaries from them. I'm reminded, God, this is why this <laughs> right. is why we're having a constitution. Why we need a constitution? Right. Well, if because we've got a lawless legislature. If people don't even understand an issue, all they have to do is look at people that support one issue or another issue on either side. And when you see John Coghill and Kathy Giesel and Luke Hopkins and Bryce Edgman and Bruce Patello, and you, when you see those names, you realize, well, those are people I all philosophically oppose. So, of course, I need to stand in exact opposition of whatever they're proposing. What they need. One minute. I, I mean, they're not going to take advice from me. From, but what they need is somebody who's pro PFD in that list. And they, they probably can't get them, but somebody who's pro PFD in that list. So at least they look like they are they are bipartisan in that sense about about lawless issues. Uh, but right now, it looks like it's just all the lawless people who have, si who have signed up on one side and say, hey, we want to continue the lawlessness. <laughs> so right. don't don't vote to change the Constitution that would take away our ability to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Seriously. Uh, at some point, all you have to do is look at the people who are standing against you and decide on an issue, even if you don't know the details of it. That's enough for most people to look at and go, nope. Yeah, I don't I don't you know, I. Constitution is, as I say, I, I look at the Constitutional Convention as a as a as a big risk, and I don't think we've even seen the big shoe yet to drop. If the Supreme Court, United States Supreme Court, overturns Roe versus Wade uh, this summer and sends the issue back to this back to the states, I think the big force in the Constitutional Convention is going to be the right to life movement getting in there and saying we need to undo the the, the right to privacy provision. Uh, in the Alaska Constitution, so that we can implement restrictions on uh, uh, restrictions on uh, on abortion, and I and I think that's going to be the by the time we get to next fall, I think that's going to be the big driver uh, in uh, in a constitutional convention. And frankly, I think we may see John Coghill drop off as a drop off as a, as a as a proponent of keeping the Constitution the way it is because of that. But it's but it just it right now it's just it's just bizarre. I mean. The, the legislature is lawless. The reason people want a constitutional convention is because the legislature is lawless. And, and it's like, you know, people are, these people are saying, oh, no, we need to keep, we need to keep the Constitution. And they're just sort of, when they write these articles and they use those people as, uh, they use Coghill and, and Giesel and Edgman as the lead, it's sort of like they're just rubbing it in your face, right? They're rubbing in the face. Hey, we've been lawless. We want to stay. We want to, we want to remain lawless. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so we're going to, uh, uh, we're, we, we want you to, to continue to support the constitution as it is. Cause it lets us be lawless. Right. Right. Well, maybe next week we should pick up and talk about the con con. Cause I gotta be honest, I have a lot of the same reservations that you have. Uh, I always have anytime you open up a constitution, you know, you can, you, there's a lot of things you could fix for sure, but there's a lot of messes that could be made in there as well. But I'm starting to come 
to the conclusion, you know, in my balancing scales of should we or shouldn't we, I'm starting to come to the conclusion that the lawlessness is so prevalent in the legislature that it may be the only solution to be able, the only way to fix it as we, as we see this. We, you know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really torn on this. Uh, and so maybe we should spend some time on that next week and, and talk about your concerns and my concerns, but at the same time, looking at it as if it might be the only solution based on what you're just saying on all this lawlessness. Yeah, it's it certainly, I mean, certainly the best argument for, to me for the, for, for CONCON is the lawlessness of the legislature, not just the PFD, but the 90 day session and everything else they ignore. Uh, that's certainly the best argument for it. I, I think there are countervailing arguments that outweigh that, but that's certainly the best argument. And, and I look forward to discussing it with you. All right. Well, let's pick that up next week. Anything else you're watching this week for folks before we got about two minutes here before we uh, run the clock back out to hour two. So any, uh, any, anything else you're going to be watching this week or that we should be looking for in your mind as we watch what's going on in the Senate? Well, on the Senate side, it's certainly going to be what's going on in the Senate finance, uh, both from the standpoint of how they deal with the budget. Is there, w- will they blow it out? Will somebody just start adding money and money and money? Uh, and then on the Senate side, how they deal with the PFD issue. Are they going to try to push uh, Senate Bill 299 or uh, are they going to just sort of muddle through it uh, like they have before? On the House side, what I'm watching is these bills, <coughs> excuse me, now if they've got the budget out, I'm watching these bills on defined benefit program uh, and on uh, permanent BSA increases and, uh, and watch those uh, as they're coming up. Those are bills I also think the governor would veto if they came to him. Uh, but again, this is all politically me- political messaging now. I think that some are going to try to push those, push those through the House. So I'm going to be watching those. Well, I got to say that <clears throat> I'm a little... Uh... I'm a little one. I'm a little worried as to what the governor may or may not veto. As you said, there's a lot of political ramifications, uh, whether it's the 1.2 billion in forward funding for education or some of these other things. Uh, I'm wondering just how much his handlers are squeezing him to vote one way or the other. There's a lot of stuff that I would like to see the red pen taken to, um, and I just have a feeling that it's not going to be. I guess is I guess I'm just going to say we're not going to see as many red lines as I think that we should in the uh, in the upcoming budget uh, because of the political nature of this at this point. Yeah, well, it'd be good if those bills don't make it to him. I mean, the bills that that would permanently increase spending, like a BSA increase or like defined benefit, it'd be good if those bills don't make it to him. But um, you know, they may. I mean, political messaging may be in the House side and in the Senate side that they may want to push those forward. So that anyway, that's what I'm going to be watching on the House side, whether those bills, how those bills are handled, whether they whether they come up. And then there's also on the House side, there's the the House Ways and Means POMB 2575 bill, and that'll be before House Finance at some point. So I'll be looking for that as well. All right, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, as always, we appreciate you coming on board. Thank you for uh, thank you for being part of it today. Michael, thanks for having me, and I look forward to next week's discussion. All right, we'll see what it looks like. That Maybe it'll be just as messy as it could possibly be. We'll have to see. That'll make life more interesting. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.